the Andrew Holness administration is embarking on the most comprehensive constitutional reform work to be undertaken in the nation of Jamaica with a view to craft a new modern constitution of Jamaica. The goal is not simply to swap a foreign monarch, the King of England, for a local president. We hope to use the opportunity to facilitate a reset of the nation moving to a culture of excellence and discipline. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. A high-level constitutional reform committee has been established. The role of this committee is to assist in providing expert guidance and oversight to the government and people of Jamaica during the constitutional reform process that will implement recommendations on which consensus exists while helping to build consensus where it has eroded or is non-existent on related reform matters. This high-level constitutional reform committee will assess how the passage of time has impacted the recommendations of the Joint Select Committee on constitutional and electoral reform contained in the report of 1995, which was submitted to and approved by the Parliament, and they will advise on what fresh perspectives are to be considered in light of developments between then and now. The Constitutional Reform Committee is also to assist in coordinating the required parliamentary cross aisles and nationwide consultation and collaboration during the various phases of Jamaica's constitutional reform work. The committee will help to educate the electorate on their role in the referendum process to successfully transition Jamaica from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. A message from the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Jamaica, we want to hear from you and Manchester, you are our next stop. Join the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs on the Road to Republic on Wednesday, May 17, 2023 at 5 p.m. at the Mandeville Parish Church Hall. Come and share your views and opinions on Jamaica becoming a republic. Let your voices be heard. That's Wednesday, May 17, 2023 at 5 p.m. at the Mandeville Parish Church Hall. See you there. Four and a half thousand miles away from Britain, Jamaica has remnants of its colonial past present everywhere. But the country's future is changing. Sky News can reveal the coronation of King Charles has sped up the government's plans for a Jamaican Republic. A senior minister told me legislation for a public vote could come as soon as this month. We're looking at holding the referendum in 2024. Okay, so as early as 2024, we're saying that Jamaica could potentially be a republic. Time has come. Jamaican in Jamaican hands. In downtown Kingston, not all Jamaicans are ready to cut ties with Britain so soon. A lot of Rastas would say, yes, but I don't think it's not going to be better. We don't think we are ready for it. We don't have the resource. Um, we, we don't. We're like a child. You cannot leave a child like that. And I want to tell you something. Stick to the evil that you know. I, I'm not saying they're good, you know. I'm not going to tell you that they're good. They are evil, but I will stick to them, to the evil that I know. But does the status quo help Jamaicans pay the bills? Many young people, especially in asking, what's the relevance? How does you know, a king affect the price of bread. A recent royal trip to Jamaica where senior royals failed to apologize for slavery has also hit a nerve. 
Slavery was abhorrent, and it should never have happened. Why not a full apology? Is it because you may have to give back the wealth of the monarchy taken from the people, taken from the places that were colonized, taken from the places where the people were enslaved? But it's not just the royal family swaying public opinion in Jamaica. Windrush, it's personal for people. The policies that are racist and unjust by virtue of nationality and, and ethnic background and the color of your skin. That's just not right. In part, what you're calling racist policies of the British government are influencing Jamaica's decision to become a republic. Yes. Strong sentiments, but by no means a done deal. Recent polling just about favors a Jamaican republic. The winning hand could be played in 2024. Saba Chowdhury, Sky News in Kingston, Jamaica. Jamaica's rich culture was developed from the melting pot of diverse people who were brought to the country's beautiful shores by a colonization. Jamaica, meaning a land of wood and water, is one of the Caribbean's most beautiful tourist destinations. Not deterred by our limited resources, the talent and passion of the Jamaican people have resulted in many aspects of the Jamaican culture being adopted by other countries far and wide. Reggae music and the Rastafarian culture have proliferated the world through the positive and uplifting lyrical messages of one of the world's greatest musical icons, the great Robert Nesta Marley, better known as Bob Marley.
Join the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs on the Road to Republic on Wednesday, May 17, 2023 at 5 p.m. at the Mandeville Parish Church Hall. Come and share your views and opinions on Jamaica becoming a republic. Let your voices be heard. That's Wednesday, May 17, 2023 at 5 p.m. at the Mandeville Parish Church Hall. See you there. As children, we learn the true meaning of being a hero. Being a hero requires great sacrifice for others, for others, not just ourselves. We learn about the heroes of Jamaica's past and how much of themselves and their lives they had to give in building a nation we should be proud to call home. They believed in a Jamaica that was more than just a country, more than just an island, more than land surrounded by water. They believed in a dream of a free nation of people. A nation built on the foundation of their sacrifices. A nation of many people working as one. A nation that will continue to produce legends and nation builders that serve towards that vision. As children, we were also taught the National Pledge, a solemn promise, an undertaking. I would like to believe Sir Hugh Sherlock, while writing this pledge, understood the vision and dreams of our heroes. It's clear being a hero is too much to ever ask any one citizen. Luckily, the pledge does not require heroics of any of us. It merely asks that we honor our heroes by striving to advance our nation and ultimately inspire the world, like they and many Jamaicans have done. It's important we remember those words. These words. Before God and all mankind, I pledge the love and loyalty of my heart, the wisdom and courage of my mind, the strength and vigor of my body in service of my fellow citizens. I promise to stand up for justice, brotherhood and peace, to work diligently and creatively, to think generously and honestly, so that Jamaica may, under God, increase in beauty, fellowship and prosperity, and play her part in advancing the welfare of the whole human race.
If you're like me, a Jamaican born and raised on this land, maybe you will remember saying those words, singing that song in a classroom or some general assembly. If so, like me, you made a pledge. Somehow it seems like many of us have forgotten that. The crime and violence, the indiscipline and short-sightedness, the corruption, the lack of respect for our beautiful lands we are blessed with and the waters that surround and nurtures us. We have to do better. Let us honor our heroes so that they would not have sacrificed so much in vain. I hope this video can make a difference to even one soul. If so, The Andrew Holness administration is embarking on the most comprehensive constitutional reform work to be undertaken in the nation of Jamaica with a view to craft a new... Welcome everyone. Good evening. I had to say welcome to Mandeville when we're in Mandeville. It's more welcome to the Constitutional Reform Committee. Welcome to Mandeville. It says here on that I'm supposed to give a welcome, but I'm going to start by asking a member of the committee, Dr. David Henry, to say a prayer for us, and then we get into the business of the evening. Dr. Henry? Who is behind me somewhere? <laughs> Prayer, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence here today as eternal Father. And uh, we pray your guidance, your insight, your discernment, your blessing on these proceedings. We are at a very important juncture in our nation's history, and we pray, Lord, that you would guide us as we seek to address matters of constitutional reform. We ask for your wisdom, and we pray, Lord, that every contribution will be heard, will be received, and that together we'll be able to build the kind of Jamaica that we all long for. So we ask your blessing on these proceedings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to start by recognizing our Custos, um, who is always with us, the Honorable Garfield Green. We have behind us, behind me, the Minister and Co-Chair of the Constitutional Reform Committee, the Honorable Marlene Malahu Fort, or Members of Parliament, too, from Manchester. Um, ladies first, Rhoda Moy Crawford and Mikhail Phillips, 
counselors present. I don't want to start naming and miss out anyone, but I see Lizzie, I see Mr. Holy. I suspect there are more, but poor eyesight, you know, going away. But importantly, I want to welcome the members of the Constitutional Reform Committee who are here with us this evening. I'll have to look around to see who is on stage. I see Dr. Nadine Spence, Dr. David Henry, Senator Donna Scott Motley, and of course, Mr. Hugh Small, former countryman but moved back to Kingston. In front of me, I see Ambassador Rocky Mead. You know, I don't know if Rocky is his real first name, you know, so <laughs> I had to stumble a little bit. Um, Lalita Davis Mattis, Dr. Elaine McCarthy, and did I miss anyone? Sujay Boswell, but I'm not seeing Sujay. He was here earlier. He's, I don't know why he's gone to the back of the room, but Sujay Boswell is here also. And I welcome them to Mandeville because I know we will give them a good reception. And what do I mean by a good reception? <laughs> you know, I was, when you reach a certain stage in life, you can reminisce. And I was reminiscing with Stafford Horton a, a few minutes ago that he is a regular attendee to these meetings. So over the span of 30-something years, we've come to a series of public fora. This is not the first, let me tell everybody. And this is why I say Mandeville is an interesting town because we always get good engagement in these sorts of um, opportunities to engage our lawmakers, our policymakers in improving our systems of governance. So we have been here before. We have been here talking about cabinet size, I remember we had, um, back in the early 90s, 92, 93 maybe, we had um, a public forum at the Cecil Charlton Hall. And you might recall, I remember D.K. Duncan was there, um, Dorothy Lightburn and others were there. Good public engagements. And we have had several over the years. I remember being a panelist on one with the Honorable David Corr, David Batts, who is now a, a judge, talking about the... Um, trying to remember which one, no, Caribbean Court of Appeal. So we have had different engagements, and I know we will do well here this evening. And why do I say we will do well? <clears throat> A lot of the dialogue that has taken place so far is what are they going to do? What are our lawmakers going to do? And I always deflect that question back to say, what are we, the citizens, doing to ensure that we have a process and an outcome that we want. What are we doing to inform ourselves, to engage, and to get our views out there? We have so many media now to let our views be heard. And I can tell you there's an earnest desire by this committee to hear the views of our people. So when people say, boy, I may never know this, or I didn't see that, or this didn't happen, I say, what did you make happen? When did you go to, in your group, your sphere of influence, your constituency, and I don't mean political constituency. Your constituency might be a yard, you know. <laughs> might be a schoolroom, might be your office, might be your association, your church. There's nothing wrong, pastors, we are well represented on the committee, with at the end of the gospel, and you're engaging in community matters, to engage in national matters. There's a website, well, maybe at the end we'll hear all of this. But let me get into the business of today. There are terms of reference, of course, and I was being vain a while ago, I had to put on my glasses. The issues include, one, transforming the form of government, which a lot of people would have heard about, abolishing the constitutional monarchy, uh, with King Charles III, King of Jamaica, and replacing it with a Jamaican head of state, or not. Two, creating the office of the president of the Republic of Jamaica, the formal head of state for the Republic of Jamaica, separate from the office of the head of government, or not. A type of president, is it going to be an executive president, a non-executive president, or a mix of the two? Will, it have, will the president, he or she, or I should say she or he, have ceremonial powers, legislative powers, executive powers, 
and so on. Will it be a fixed term on tenure? Will it be a number of terms? Will it have overlapping terms with the representatives? And so on. Three, establishing the rules for the selection of this president. Nomination by the prime minister in consultation with the leader of the opposition. Um, parliamentary confirmation, joint sitting of both houses, and so on and so forth. And you would know, of course, bubbling underneath all of this, a lot of people are asking whether we're going to have a directly elected president. Four, the eligibility to serve in parliament, the House of Representatives and the Senate, whether citizenship now is extended as we have traditionally since independence to citizens of the Commonwealth, or are we going to look again, we look at the whole question of citizens and say, who is a Jamaican citizen entitled to sit in parliament and to hold these types of public office? Residency, and so on and so forth. And fifth, the composition and selection of the Senate. Sixth, the life of parliament, an extension to respond to emergencies other than war and calamities like pandemics. Um, I see greetings, of course, from the Costas first. You won't hear a lot from me this evening because we want to hear from you, Costas. Podium is yours, sir. Sorry, the lectern is yours, sir. I keep saying podium. It's not a podium. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wayne Chen, our moderator. I may acknowledge the Honorable Marlene Maluho Fort Casey MP, Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, Senator Donna Scott Motley. Is she here? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yes, and other members of the Constitutional Reform Committee, Mr. Wayne Robinson, and I dare say my friend, and he's a permanent secretary in the ministry, members of the political directorate, other invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And may I also acknowledge members of the security forces. We are safe, Mikhail. Right? They are on the back. Yes, man. <laughs> Please allow me to extend a special welcome to the members of the Constitutional Reform Committee to the best parish, Manchester. Minister. Go ahead and clap, man. Yes, yeah, the best parish. So, Minister, we appreciate you taking this to us, and we intend to participate fully and productively to the process. Ladies and gentlemen, the Constitutional Reform Committee was established to assist in providing expert guidance and oversight to the government and people of Jamaica during the constitutional reform process, and of course, this involves the citizenry of the country. And I'm honored to be here today to share my thoughts with you as we are asked to participate. Jamaica is one of the few countries in the world that still has a constitutional monarchy, with the King of England as our head of state. This means that we do not have full sovereignty over our own affairs, and that we are subject to the laws and decision of a foreign power. It is believed that this is not acceptable for a sovereign nation in the 21st century when we have achieved so much as a nation and as a people. It is widely believed that if we had a constitutional republic, this would give us more control over our destiny and more respect and dignity in the international community. It would also reflect our rich and diverse culture, our history, of struggle and resilience, and our aspirations for the future. A republic would be more democratic, more accountable, and more responsive to the needs and wishes of the Jamaican people. The government of Jamaica has taken the bold step and wants to include us. The time has come for us to become a republic. The time has come for us to make our own history, but we must do so responsibly. I therefore ask that we participate in the process for which we must be proud of. We must take clear of misinformation and not to become misguided in our judgment and decision process 
we should not allow what happened to us during COVID to happen to us again. We followed a lot of story out there and we did not protect ourselves by getting vaccinated. But let us look at Brexit as an example, where 52% voted for them to leave the EU. And the large majority of the 52% did not know what they voted for. They followed the crowd, they followed the noise and voted. And they regretted it. Yes, let it not happen to us. And I also want to point to some things that I've been hearing. The, the committee is made up of a wide cross-section. The church, civil society, politicians on both sides. And I think all of us have access to one, at least one of them. But that I hear comments in the media about what is happening to the, to the process. They want to make suggestions as what to happen. Instead of speaking to their leader who sits on the, com and on the committee, they go in the media and they speak of, share their opinions rather. Don't know why, but it can create it has potential consequences. And we should always remember that our comments have the power to influence others and to shape their opinion. And that is what I'm asking us to avoid. Let us not speculate. Let us not speak loosely. I'm sure the committee will share with you how you can contact them and share your, your opinions further from this evening with them. The constitution of a country is a cornerstone of its governance system. It outlines the fundamental principles and values that guide the functioning of the state and its institutions. It is a living document that reflects the changing needs and aspirations of the society it serves. One of the pressing issues that require attention is the need to strengthen our democratic institutions. And we have witnessed a growing mistrust in our political system and a decline in public participation. This evening, we're going to change that narrative, right? We need to address these issues and ensure that our institutions are accountable, transparent, and responsive to the needs of the people. As I conclude, I'm encouraging all of us to participate fully and to be part of, making, of the making of history in our country. And I wanted us to remind us one more time to avoid loose comments out there. Be wise in your thinking and in your decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. I will now invite the Member of Parliament for Manchester Northwestern, Mr. Michael Phillips, to offer greetings. But I see him got, he got distracted. There's a... <laughs> You know, I had the Custos laughing, and no disrespect to my colleague MP. When you said man, member parliament for Manchester, I said MP for Manchester. Yeah, so Custos is, is laughing. But, yeah. um, let me welcome the committee to the happiest parish in Jamaica. Yeah? As I the Custos was laughing. Despite the challenges that we're having, we're still the happiest parish. That's why we can laugh like that, right, Rhoda? Yes. Um, former member of parliament, councillors, minister. I see some of my church members. This is my church, minister. Yes, this is my church. Um, residents of Manchester, a pleasant good afternoon. Um, a discussion like this is one that we should all get involved in. And I, I, I have to say that I'm a little bit disappointed in the turnout. Yes. Because, I mean, I tried to see if we could get some of the schools here because I think it is important for the students themselves, the next generation, to understand why it is that we are having this discussion and we are pushing forward for Jamaica to be a republic. The minister and myself has 
we have had many discussions, and, and Senator um, Donna, we have had many discussions on the issue. Because as far back, right excellent Marcus Garvey, as early as 1932, made the first definitive call for self-governance and shared his vision for what he called the new Jamaica. The debate of removing the monarch as our head of state has been a long-standing one and issue for us as Jamaica. The conversation started shortly after our own independence. Uh, we are now 60 years going on. It is vital that our journey to independence is well understood. And I've heard the discussion that many a public conversation has taken place and that we don't really need to go back to a wide cross-section for that conversation. But life is not still. There are generations that would have come and generations would have, that have, would have gone. But many Jamaicans still not understanding why there are some that is still pushing for us to be a republic. In the past, we have seen polls done where 60% of Jamaicans say we should remain. As time go by, we see more Jamaicans saying that we need our own identity. Many Jamaicans may not have thought seriously about the issue of Jamaica becoming a republic. It is critical for our own identity as a race of black people. Becoming a republic is symbolic of us removing the shackles of slavery and oppression and removing the image of our colonial past masters who had dominion over us. That for me is important. So many or too many conversations have taken place. The important thing is that even both political parties had their differences and we have come to a point of compromise on how it is to move forward. Every, member, every prime minister has spoken about Jamaica becoming a republic. We have not yet gotten there. In December 2020, I tabled a motion, in pri a private member's motion in Parliament for the removal of the then Queen of the Monarchy as our Head of State. I was compelled to do it at the time because myself and the Prime Minister are of the same generation. We're of the same age. And if the generation before was not able to, then I thought it important that at least someone of my generation, because this wasn't about me being a member of the People's National Party. It was me being a Jamaican that would want to see us have our own identity. Our complete independence would come when not only becoming a republic, but also when we remove ourselves from the Privy Council and have the CCJ as our final court. This is a conversation, as I started out by saying, I'm happy to see that the conversation is being carried out into the communities because every Jamaican needs to have their voice heard. But I hope that we don't tinker with this opportunity and not make it happen. I think the time is now for us to have our own identity as Africans, as Jamaican people, bringing back that constitution home that we have our own identity as our people. Thank you very much. Thank you, member. <laughs> I'm now invited to, as you said, Manchester. It crossed my mind that our next member coming to the lectern <laughs> is Manchester Central. But you know, the interesting thing is that she's the first woman to <laughs> in almost eight years of adult suffrage to be elected from this parish. It's not really blot on us, but Mrs. Miss Rodemoy Crawford, Member of Parliament for Manchester Central. Thank you. 
Mr. Master of Ceremonies. You know, when MP Mikhail Phillips mentioned that this is the happiest parish, I realized that our visitors especially had a quizzical look on their faces. And I'm just here to put that to rest. It is true, a survey was recently conducted across the island and it was found that the people of Manchester are the happiest people on the island. Distinguished, <laughs> distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant evening to you. I, I greet especially my constituents warmly. It's always very good to see my constituents, to greet, to greet you and to share my time with you. It's always, always also a pleasure to see my colleague, Member of Parliament, MP Phillips, and the other members of Parliament from the neighboring constituents and their constituents. You know, we live like a family here. Welcome, Senator Bunting. It's good to see you. You can take a seat closer up. I, I wish to, I, I have, and pardon me, my constituents and constituents from neighboring constituencies here in Manchester. I'm very excited about today, and I reserve a very, very special greeting to and warm, well, not warm, cool, cool, cool welcome to Mandeville to our very, very hardworking, brilliant, and dignified Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, the Honorable Marlene Malahu Ford. She has been doing an exceptional job. Minister Malahu Ford, Welcome to the best constituency in Jamaica. <laughs> to the members of the Constitutional Affairs Committee, I greet you well. I thank you so much for your willingness to serve in this capacity. Your sacrifices have not gone unnoticed, and I know that history and the people of Jamaica will be kind to you when this process has been completed. It is true, uh, Jamaica in her 60 years, I'm only 34, so I only know a little more than half. Jamaica in her 60 years have experienced several changes and quite a number of positive transformation. And here we are again, at a very historically exciting juncture. We are seeking to reform our constitution, and more importantly, we're seeking to become a republic. And what I'm very happy about this process and this juncture of the journey and the decisions that have been taken so far by the government and, of course, the members of the Constitutional Affairs Committee is to embark on these consultations because what it does is it allows citizens, all citizens, the equal opportunity to ask your questions and to share your views. And so I want to encourage all of you who are here to make sure you take full advantage of this session. Do not be afraid to ask your questions. Do not be afraid to share your concerns. And I'm very happy that persons are coming in, that more persons are coming in. And I, I wonder if MP Mikhail took some persons from Northwest to join us. Okay. All right, those who are not here, I'm sure the videos will be made available and we can share and the discussions will continue. Welcome again to the best constituency in Jamaica. Have a good time. Thank you, ma'am. And without further ado, I will invite the Honorable Marlene Malahu Fort, KC, and that's not Fortis, that's King's Council, 
JP, MP, the Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, and the co-chair of the Constitutional Reform Committee to make her presentation. Thank you to the very distinguished moderator, Mr. Wayne Chen, LLB, JP. I was asking him whether he had missed practicing the law, and then he told me he had never really practiced the law, but constitutional law is actually his favorite subject. Thank you so much for um, graciously accepting our invitation to moderate this important public engagement. I'm Costos colleague MPs, fellow CRC members, distinguished ladies and gentlemen all. It's usually a cool, cool time in Mandeville, but it's a warm, warm afternoon. <laughs> I'm so pleased to be here to engage with you, along with members of the Constitutional Reform Committee. Constitutional reform is a very involved and complex process. The work that we are doing is being done in phases. And we have so far set out three phases. We will begin with those matters requiring change that must ultimately be approved by the people. And that simply is what the referendum is. The matters are fixed in the Constitution. I don't get to choose them, and you don't get to choose them. They are the same set of matters since the Constitution came into force in 1962. A lot of work has been done in the past about changing the form of government in particular. And currently, we have, as you have heard, a constitutional monarchy, because the Constitution vests the executive authority of Jamaica in the monarch, now in the person of King Charles III, King of Jamaica. King Charles III, King of Jamaica. You may not have a thought of him like that, but constitutionally, when we refer to the king, he is King of Jamaica. The Constitution, as our supreme law, also sets out the major institutions in the country, and it sets out the distribution of power, who does what, broadly speaking. The parliament, as one of, as a legislative branch of government, also comprises King Charles III, King of Jamaica, a Senate, and a House of Representatives. In this phase of the reform, the goal is to, among other things, abolish the constitutional monarchy as our form of government and replace it with a republican form of government. And republics emerged as alternatives to monarchies. This will mean creating an office of head of state, formal head of state, one that is not a representative of a foreign monarch who is also our monarch. One of the questions, as you heard from the moderator, is what type of presidency we should have and what powers should be vested in the office of president as the formal head of state for the proposed Republic of Jamaica. All countries have a formal head of state and a head of government. Some countries have the same office holder for both. And one of the questions is whether we will continue what we have 
except that our new head of state would be a head of state in his or her own right instead of being a representative of the monarch. There is a process that we have to go through. It is a specific process. It doesn't matter how much agreement we have reached on the need for change. If we do not go through the lawmaking process, we will not achieve the change. And this process means that we have to put a bill before the parliament, and bill is the name that you give to a law while it is being made before it's actually passed as law. And that bill has to be passed by both houses of parliament with a special two-thirds vote. And thereafter, it has to be approved by the people who are registered to vote. So it's not any member of the public, but a person who is registered to vote. And that simply is what the referendum is. For the kind of changes that we are seeking to make in this phase, there is also a specific process that you have to abide by when the law goes before the parliament. A period of three, at least three months must elapse between the tabling of the bill, that is when you introduce the proposed law into the parliament. So that's the tabling, what we call the first reading of the bill. And then the second reading, when you commence debate on the whole text of the bill, three months. So in the normal course of things, outside of specific matters in the Constitution, you can table a bill and you can suspend the standing orders, which are the rules of the parliament, and you can debate it, vote on it in a day. We have done it in the parliament. It's the exception, not the rule. Or you table it and you commence the debate the following week and you pass it. Not so for the kind of reforms that we're seeking to make to the Constitution. Three months between the first reading and the second reading, between the time when the bill is tabled and when the debate commences. And then after the debate is concluded, another three months must pass before you vote on it. And the big question is what do we do with those two periods of at least three months? because the people will have to vote to approve the bill after it is passed by both houses of parliament. That time is to be spent educating the people and consulting. First of all, letting you know what is in the bill, because even though we will have discussion here before the bill is tabled, you will still have to know what ends up in the bill. Sometimes the discussions are much broader than what actually goes in the bill. And then, after the debate is concluded, we will have to assess whether there is anything to be taken into account that may require an amendment to the bill before it is passed. Then it goes to the Senate. The Senate has to pass it with a two-thirds vote, and that can only happen if both government and opposition approve. At least one member of the opposition in the Senate would be required to vote in favor for the two-thirds vote to be achieved. And then there is also a delay period before it goes to the people. So it's a very specific process. I do not determine it. The Constitution itself sets out what that process is. And it has to be honored, because if it is not honored, then the bill will not be valid. It's technical work. So we really want to hear from you, and we want to hear your views on the matters being deliberated on. Already, there are numerous questions being asked. A lot has been said about what the committee is doing and not doing. Be assured that we are not a committee that is a, a secret clan working behind closed doors to cook up anything to put before the people. We're not starting the work from scratch. We're actually building on work previously done. We're assessing recommendations previously made to the parliament, but which were not implemented. 
and given the passage of time between when the recommendations were made and now, the government thought it fit to see what fresh perspectives need to be considered before we implement. There is really no room for change in the subject matters that require the approval of the people to change in the Constitution. Like I said before, those are set. So we're here to take your questions. Hopefully we will be able to clarify and answer the questions, but we also want to hear your views because your views matter. Uh, and it is because you also have to participate in the process why we must engage with you. Um, in the normal course of things, your representatives in parliament would vote to make laws the only time the people of Jamaica will participate directly in the lawmaking process is when we are changing those matters specified in the Constitution. They are regarded as the deeply entrenched provisions. Deep because they are given the highest level of protection. So parliamentarians by themselves can't change them because they go to the heart of our, of our system of governance. And this is where we are in the constitutional reform process. I look forward to hearing your views and hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Me again. We're moving the lectern over here. And this is the, 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 the best part of it, the part when you, the citizens, get your opportunity to ask questions or share your views. If you believe I've been a little bit light-hearted, it's only to get everybody comfortable. I don't want us to feel overawed or intimidated by the occasion or by the <clears throat> caliber of folks you see on the committee and feel embarrassed. I want people to come up and ask the questions and share their views. Minister has already said that even if the views or the questions are not strictly speaking within the current ambit of the committee, it's important we hear because this is the beginning of the process and hopefully it will be a process that will continue after the instant issues are dealt with. Mr. Atkinson, I call him he's my junior at school, you know. David, stand up and ask your question, so. No, as I just wanted to <laughs> the question I was asking is the committee, how many members are there on the committee and how is it made up? Because you know we have heard some things and I just want to be sure. And is the committee still as it was at the beginning, or has someone been removed? <laughs> no one has been removed from the committee. We have had an addition since the members were first named publicly by Prime Minister Holness. But the committee was constituted on March 1 and formally announced on March 22 okay. of this year. It, the committee comprises members of both sides of the House because the bill has to be passed by the Parliament and it requires bipartisan um, approval. It comprises member of civil society, the wider society, civil society, faith-based society, experts, constitutional law experts, national and international youth representative. Uh, the, I believe those are they, okay. yes. And then we have a process for subcommittees to engage other members of the public. Okay. One more point, Mr. Head. Hey boy. Um, <laughs> I haven't heard anything about fixed election dates, and for me that is vital. We have had situation over the years that 
our Prime Minister has manipulated the date of elections. We have the situation right now that parish council elections have been delayed three times. And I really would like to see in a new constitution that there's a fixed election date. We don't want a repeat of 1983 where we didn't have another election until 1989. We need you to give the people back some power. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Can you identify yourself before you speak? Sure. Uh, my name is Anthony Hutchinson. Um, I'm a retired farmer. Yeah. Um, let me, I just want to say, I have two points that I want to raise. But before that, I just want to say, I have very strong views. So I mean no disrespect at any time to anyone. OK? Um, I'm a child of the 60s, which should be obvious. And, and when I was at high school, we were always hearing about the brightest and the best, and that we could depend on these people to take us forward. I'm appealing to people in my generation. We made this mistake already, and here we are. We had Prime Minister Michael Manley, Prime Minister Edward Siaga, Prime Minister PJ Patterson, Prime Minister Bruce Golden, and we are still here. All bright people we are still here. Because the fact is that bright people, just like anybody else, have a part to play. One part among many parts. And we would like bright people, and I, 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 I th I'm, th <coughs> sorry. I'm thankful to, to, to Minister Malahu Ford for the procedure here, because I think it is vital, yeah? Okay. My second point. I, um, I, I am a fin, fin, I'm a Finsaki. Okay, I'm a Finsaki. Okay, I got into Finsaki in the first place largely because of the length of time taken by the Manchester Municipal Corporation to do its job. Yeah. Unfortunately, I find myself in a similar position today where I have submitted some documents from November last year. And I'm being told, I'm being told now that I just have to wait. Now, my understanding of governance is that the people are sacrosanct. You don't tell the people that they just have to wait. At least give them some kind of um, <clears throat> there should be some kind of transparency, saying your application requires these things, it is here now, we give you so much time before it is ready. At least tell me that. But just to tell me that I just have to wait is unreasonable, right? And I'm saying we need to be, we need, because my concern here, apart from getting myself out of the current situation, is how does, how will this work for my grandchildren, okay? We need to, I need to think about that from now. So I'm putting, I'm asking a question, or I'm putting it on the table, that we need to <clears throat> have our governance structures much more responsive to the needs of the people. And instead of running ahead as if you are some kind of boss, and I am some kind of follower, that must just follow your lead. This is not acceptable. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Mr. Hutchinson. Uh, good evening. My question is... Your, your name, sir. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my name is Alvin Gregory, and I'm a mariner. Um, my question is in two parts. In light of the um, substantial pushback that the committee has had, about recommending a ceremonial head of state. Do you now accept that it was premature for you to announce that decision before these public consultations? And my second part is about the um, same thing on the theme of the 
president, or a, what you call a um, republic. Uh, a republic. My question is, um, you have recommended a ceremonial head of state. And in this document that you gave us this evening, I can see the thinking behind that. It lays out why, why you think that is, uh, a, it's best to go with a ceremonial head of state. My question is, why can't we have our cake and eat it? Why can't we have a ceremonial head of state and a directly elected head of the government? So one of the reasons I say this is because I'm of the view that a ceremonial head of state does play some very good roles. For example, the ex very existence of this committee, I suspect the Governor General exercised some soft power behind the scenes to get this committee going because of the disagreement that existed between the opposition and the government. So I am saying we, we can have both. We can have a ceremonial head of state and we can have a directly elected executive. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Costas. Do I need to introduce myself? Can I respond to his first question, um, Chairman? Okay. Oh, sure. I think it's Mr. Greg. Dr. Henry. Yes. You, you, you raised two questions, right? You raised two questions, right? The first has to do with the pushback concerning the recommendation that is out there concerning the appointment of a head of state. I just wanted to clarify something in terms of how the committee functions. We have discussed among ourselves a number of things, recommendations which would have been made by previous committees and so on. And we have come to, how would I dis describe it, perspectives on certain matters, but those are not final. And so when we put something out there, we're not saying this is where we are and it's fixed. We're actually saying we're inviting your feedback, your pushback, your commentary, your suggestions, your insights in relation to those matters. And this is precisely why we are here. So whatever you have heard as decisions of the committee, they are not fixed, they are not final, they are perspectives and we are inviting your commentary on it. And can I add to that? In fact, that was the exact opposite. If there was a perspective that was in the meetings that we had, that would not have been it. And that was not a perspective that was shared from us. I think people, just said that we said ceremonial president, we didn't. Because I remember our, our discussions were precisely that we did not, none of us on the committee wanted a ceremonial president. So that could not have been something that we put out there because we were not um, of a mind to, to make, to come to that agreement. We all felt that Jamaicans, us included, had an issue with this idea of a titular head of state. So the honest truth is nobody communicated a ceremonial head of state as a final decision of the committee. I think people ran away with a number of conclusions. In, 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 in our discussions that we talked about was a, a, a model specific to Jamaica that would represent the views of Jamaicans. Um, bearing in mind what Dr. Henry said that all we can do as a committee is recommend for Jamaicans to consider but we would never have thought of a ceremonial head because that was not what the committee was minded to do. Thanks for that, Dr. Spence. Oh, I have a microphone for um, the legal. Oh, come right here, sorry. Let me report this right. Thanks. Thank you, I'm, I'm Lalita Davis, but I'm a member of the committee, and I just wanted to, to say, in relation to this process, it is such an important process that mandates every Jamaican to account to ourselves and to our children and to the generations to come what it is that we actually do with this process. The committee does not make decisions. The committee deliberates. They are a group of experts, and we are also taking the views of others that are not now sitting on the committee. So the work of the committee is factored around the different phases. So the minister would have identified for us this afternoon what are the elements of this first phase. And so the discussions are focused on the first phase. 
We are also aware that there are other elements that are of interest to Jamaicans. And as she also said, we are not negating those as well because some things are for the Constitution, some things are not. But we understand that this is a people process. What we are really seeking to do is to engage the public so that if the committee puts out a recommendation, it is a recommendation that we have discussed among ourselves and that we are of the view that as a committee, we believe that we need to say to Jamaicans, let's think about it this way. The recommendation from the committee is not cast in stone. It's merely a recommendation so that the, so that the people of Jamaica can comment on it. And so even this discussion this afternoon, that's what this is about. This is really about what is it that you want to see. For example, my colleague behind me just asked, are we looking at other jurisdictions outside of the Commonwealth? The answer is yes. And we have been having submissions from other groups within the society who are making all kinds of recommendations. At the end of the day, the role of the committee which respected these recommendations is to really list them, articulate them among ourselves, and then perhaps make the recommendations. If there are areas in which we, cannot, we don't reach consensus, because we have varying views, then we will say also to the public, we have not reached consensus as a group, and I want to be very careful with the word consensus, consensus in terms of what we have deliberated on to recommend. So that is really how the process really works. So in for us this afternoon, every single comment here is, taking, is going to be taken into account. Um, this is a situation where all ideas must contend. Because if we are really saying that this is a way in which we are going to Jamaicanize the Constitution, make it ours, it is not merely a process where you remove the king and replace the king with somebody else. That's not what this is. Our colleague recently mentioned the whole issue of governance. How does government work? And I will tell you that one of the issues in the committee right now, and I, will speak, I, won't, I don't wish to speak on behalf of the minister, but the issue of how government works for people is on the agenda. Because in this reform, we must ensure that government and people are accountable. And what is government? It's not just the MP sitting in parliament. It's all the civil servants, all the public servants that we have employed in this country to serve us. And I also want to make the point that sometimes, and in this particular process, I think one of the things we need to do also is to really look at how government works now. What, it, what, does, it, what, the law, what does the law say now in, in terms of government and governance? What do the policies say? Because many times, it's not a lack or any lacuna in the law, you know. It's because we ourselves don't keep the people that we have been elected accountable. So sometimes we need to look at the system. Is anything really wrong with the system? What is it that we need to do? And if it is working for us. So the issue is, as I think we have said before, it's not just a matter of making a change for making a, um, a ch just making a change for the sake of it. There must be a process behind it. There must be what is it that Jamaicans are to benefit from this new republic that we are embarking on. It can't be that tomorrow morning or next day we are now the Republic of Jamaica and everything remains the same. So it is a very involved process and the process will also involve the amendments to other legislation. It may, may, it may very well involve creating new legislation, etc. So again, I just want to encourage us to own the process. I think it's important to own the process and uh, those of us who are more endowed to explain the process and to interpret the process, I believe have a higher obligation to ensure that we interpret the process correctly and that we seek for the truth. And as someone said earlier, the committee members are accessible. And we actually have been having submissions. People have been coming in and making submissions. And we are actually inviting submissions, both written and the voucher. Thank you very much. If I, if I may do a little quick follow-up. <coughs> Thank you, ma'am. If I may just do a quick follow-up. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> I am going to read something from the Jamaica Observer. It says here, speaking with the editors and reporters at the Jamaica Observer Monday Exchange this week, Minister of Constitutional Affairs and Legal Reform, 
Marlene Malaloufort pointed out that the consensus so far is that the office of the president should be the formal head of state separate from the political head of government. That's what's in the media. That's what I read. That's what my, my question was premised on. So now you're telling me that it was not a consensus. That's what you just said. So far. No, no, you said ceremonial head. Well, I've the consensus mm -hmm. so far, as yes. we explained, as Lalita explained, consensus, which is different from saying a ceremonial president. And if you understand the difference between the different kinds of president, you will understand why that caveat of a ceremonial president makes the difference. Uh, Mr. Moderator, may I proceed? Yes, to of, of course. Mr. Mr. Gregory, um, when we speak of arriving at consensus, it means within the committee we would have deliberated on an issue and we would have gone through a process of hearing the different views, asking questions, and then see at the end of the day where we are on the subject matter. So one of the issues is what the head of, new head of state would look like. The process is to deliberate among ourselves, starting with the recommendations previously made, come to the table, hearing what people are saying, looking on the pros and cons. Um, the goal is not to uproot everything, but if something has worked well and has contributed to the stability of our democracy, we would keep it. And then we would change those um, features of the Constitution that require change. Some matters of governance are matters around enforcement and implementation of existing laws. So when I spoke to the committee arriving at consensus, it's really a consensus for recommendation, not a consensus to say that this is what should be. And then when we throw the matter out, or having deliberated among ourselves, that's not the end of it because we're going through a process. And at the end of the day, what we recommend up through to cabinet to go in the bill would be reflective of the views of the people as we understand them. And what also we believe would be in the best interest of the people of Jamaica. And once we, having heard the views, having looked at the pros and cons, we would then have to say to the people why we believe it would be the better approach to take. So it's really the process. But thank you for asking. I think it is a matter that needed clarity. I hope our collective answers have served to clarify in some way. Because it's green. Thank you. Um, minister, our entire committee, they, for a lay person, they see this change as leaving behind the king, moving away from the king, leaving the monarchy. I've heard persons in the legal fraternity say, bring the constitution home. It belongs to us. What are some of the obvious changes that we could see between the current system of government and what we are now working towards? Are there any changes that we will be able to see rather more than just to say we are no longer on the king's rule. You small, sir. I think you right, <laughs> if you walk up there with standing um, most people do not realize that the constitution of Jamaica was not it, it, made. It, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I hope you pay attention to what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like I don't like when people get distracted by my legs. <laughs> and when they attention to my legs it's because of what a lady has done to my legs. But I suppose, as I will say, the Constitution of Jamaica was made at Buckingham Palace and signed by a man named Mr. Agnew under and by the authority given by, the, by Queen Elizabeth II. 
The Constitution of Jamaica that was made in Britain is a document that creates the House of Representatives, the Senate, the Supreme Court of Jamaica, the Court of Appeal, the Atter Office of Attorney General, all of the institutions of state that we have today are the product of a piece of English legislature. Members of Parliament, Crawford and Phillips, do not sit in a Parliament that has any responsibility for what is in the Constitution except those clauses that were amended since independence and in particular the Charter of Rights. Part of the objective of this procedure is to make sure that the document which is about that fact and has just short of 200 pages is going to be legislated not only by our parliament where Donna Scott Motley sits in the second chamber and we don't want to call it as open law because actually the law is upper in that that is been put there by the people. To have a constitution that is passed by the House of Representatives and the Senate and for the first time in the entire history of Jamaica legislated by the electorate. Because when we had a referendum in 1961 it was not to create a law. It was simply to say, do we stay or do we go? And stay, lost, and go, won. And interestingly, at that time, neither of the parties was able to use their political symbols on the ballot. One of the things that we're going to have to look at this time is what are the symbols that are going to be on the ballot since although we have made some progress there is still a lot of illiteracy in the country and people must be able to know when they mark their vote beside a symbol that that is indicated yes to change or no to change. And interestingly, and I'm sure that Peter and his, uh, Michael and his colleague who sits beside him, will be interested to learn that prior to 1961, the symbol of the PNP was the head and the symbol of the JLP was the hand. They were not allowed to use those symbols in the referendum. The symbols that they had to vote for was yes was a tree and no was a bell. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. Okay. So that the process must involve people understanding why they're being asked to vote. They can only understand why they're being asked to vote if they understand what is there now and what are the changes that are desirable. And therefore, there has to be a massive program of education. And this here is a form of education, but even more important than this form of education is a form of education that is going to go into villages, bars, Parent teachers associations, branches of the, P of the PNP and, and groups of the JLP. <laughs> you paying attention? Okay. <laughs> At that level, so that they can understand what's happening. Because we assume that they are going to speak with one voice. And most importantly, we need to start the process of education now 
in the schools. There are children in, I can't remember what grades they are because I'm an old timer from before independence. There are children in fourth, fifth, and sixth forms who will be entitled to vote in a referendum. You have to have a different form of motivation to them so that they understand and that they know that they will be able to play a part in this historic experience. So it's, when we say Jamaicanize the Constitution, it means that it will be the product entirely of the House of Representatives, the Senate, and most importantly, the people. First time, we'll be making law. And that, that is going to enable us to say the people made the House of Representatives, they made the Senate, they made the court system, they made all the other officers of state, and therefore a fiwi constitution, fiwi, fiwi republic. Thank you, Mr. Small. <clears throat> you know, Minister... You, you were calling on me. Um, I think Hugh has done a good job, but I hear people say, we don't want it to be just symbolic. But before we can get beyond change being just symbolic, it's important that we understand the symbolism, because the symbolism is important, but it's not the end of it. So I just want to take a minute to tell you about the symbolism. Two things I want to add to what Hugh has said. So at present, there is a king of Jamaica. That is what King Charles is officially in relation to Jamaica, like it or not. You may not have thought of him like that, but he is King Charles III, King of Jamaica. So with a change to a republic, there will no longer be King of Jamaica. You may say it doesn't matter, it's mere symbolism, but let us start there. And in Jamaica's current system, the power to govern is actually vested in King Charles III because the executive authority of Jamaica is vested in the monarch. Now, the king of Jamaica, King Charles III, he may lawfully exercise executive powers if he wishes, even though the king rarely, if ever, exercises these powers, the possibility remains that the king could flex his powers on the island. And some may say, because it has never happened, it is so far-fetched, but it actually happened in Australia, and you can go back and check. Mm. And when <laughs> Queen Elizabeth then flexed her executive powers, that's when the Republican movement was born. So today, the new Jamaica actually must swear allegiance to King Charles III, to King Charles' heirs and successors, according to the laws of Jamaica. And the other thing is that the line of succession is based on hereditary rules. We have no say in that not even through our representatives. When Jamaica becomes a republic, succession will occur in accordance with our laws, and in particular, what we set in the Constitution or at the lower level. The second thing I want to say, that there is an irony that has had me puzzled. The United Kingdom does not have a written constitution, but Jamaica has. And our constitution has coded conventions 
We have taken on the institutions, institutions that were brought here. But we learn over time as lawyers that you have a hierarchy in laws. And at the very top is the Constitution. And below that, you have ordinary legislation. These are the Acts of Parliament. And then out of the Acts of Parliament, you may have secondary legislation. These are regulations and orders and even notices, because notices can have the effect of law. But your, the lawmaking process is vested in the Parliament. And the Parliament may delegate the functions. Now, Parliament only delegates lower-level laws to be passed by office holders, not to the major laws. And how ironic that our major law came into effect by a process that is way down on the hierarchy. Because orders in council are way down on the hierarchy. And then having the top law, the supreme law, with which every other law must be consistent as a schedule to an order. If that is not the biggest irony, I don't know what is. Believe me, much will change. Thank you, Minister. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, everyone. May God give you good health. I am Haile Mikhail Kojo. Many things to many people, including being parliamentary caretaker for Westmoreland Eastern, and also the author of this document. We, the people, propose Constitution of Republic Jamaica. That has been a public document since July 26, 2021. It contains 86 articles, arranged into seven chapters over 40 pages includes an acknowledgement and an index. You all may have a copy by sending a WhatsApp text to 1-876-225-1163. That's 1-876-225-1163. WhatsApp. <laughs> I am here today to present to the Honorable Minister this hard copy of the latest revision of We the People Proposed Constitution of Republic Jamaica dated May 1, 2023, and to ask, when may I expect to be invited to sit with the Constitutional Reform Committee to go through this art, that document article by article to see what is important and good for our country, Jamaica, land we love as we seek to make it a better place for ourselves and our future generations. Step forward, citizen. Are you putting it online for the general public to see, sir? Can you say the number again? Say the number. The public wants to know the number. Others, others, come this, see, come this way, my brother. The, 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 the audience wants to know the number because they're also interested in getting. Just the, the phone number, the phone number. The WhatsApp number you're giving us. Repeat the number, come right here. Repeat the number. Repeat the number. The number is 1876 225 1163. 225 1163. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much appreciated. Your way. You see, this is what we are talking about, you know. The citizens are the ones that drive the process. Citizens in a democracy. 
we touched on stability earlier, you know. There are some things we take for granted in Jamaica. Jamaica is one of a small handful of developing countries that have remained unbroken democracies for the 60 years. One of three, arguably four countries in the world that have remained unbroken democracies for the 60 years. Mrs. Sonia Allen. Good evening, panel. Welcome to Mandeville. My concern is, why the rush? Why the rush? This is a very serious thing. Let me just touch back a little. I can remember by the color of my hair and how I look, <laughs> I can remember as a little child hearing my parents discussing the Federation. All right? I heard them discussing it among themselves, their friends, their neighbors. It was a big thing. For those who may know history, I won't bother to go into detail. Now, here I am. And I am now being um, part of, I am being part of a discussion. But I am concerned that this thing is being rushed. And rushing amongst my people creates suspicion. We, let's just not push that aside. Um, the Costa spoke of Brexit. That's an eye-opener. And we shouldn't not think about that. I really couldn't care less whether Charles is there or he isn't. Because, frankly speaking, even in his own country, he's being put aside. But I listened to what the Honorable Minister said. And I have seen an, um, a little bit now of why I would probably want to see a republic. So you see, this, this, the forum is good. But for me, there are, we are going through some serious economic um, problems here in this country. And I don't know if this is really the right, this is going to cost the country a lot of money. And we have some very serious pressing problems. We are looking at, and it's, it's child month, it's May, and it tears my heart. I saw, uh, watched a documentary on TV just about two weeks ago, where our children were sleeping, the street children, in the old Odeon cinema in Kingston. And when the cameras went in, they were lying down in the same dirty, filthy clothes. Their feet were the same color as the tar. They had sores on their legs. It tore my heart that this is the generation that is to take over from us. To me, that's a priority. Our health system is broken. People are waiting for two years for simple hernia operations. I'm a nurse, I'm a past nurse, I'm an old nurse. It's not to be. In other countries, it's a walk-in, walk-out procedure. Water, we don't have. Every night on TV, and I'm not being facetious. I mean, I'm just expressing as a Jamaican things that to me are far more important at this moment in time than for us to be spending money on this. How many of us realize that all the paper that is used in every ministry with the Jamaican coat of arms and etc., etc., will have to be thrown out if we change, when we change, and we become a republic? There are so many things that's going to cost a lot of money. And as I, at, at my stage in life, we are, I am, and I'm sure a lot like me, we are very concerned about money and money spending. We, our roads, yes, we have lovely highways being built, but internally, I drove from here to Ocho Rios on Sunday, and I had to go through Cape Valley, and honest to God, it needs to be better. Please, that's the only central um, road we have, apart from going on the north, south, east, west highway, and that costs $6,000 just for toll. But, you know, 
I worry because there are no laws. Our laws are not protecting us. And I'm not saying the police not doing their job, but they are having a hard time coping. And the criminals are getting wiser than the police with better weapons to use. So guess what now? Where I stand. I want to hear a little bit more, Minister, and your, your um, committee. I stand correct if, it is, if you're doing that and if it is so. But I want to hear from, let us say, the legal minds of Jamaica led by the Chief Justice, our law students, our judges, our lawyers as a body and how they see this thing and what are, what are the changes and what they think. I want to see the PSOJ as a body meeting, giving their, 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 their right. I want to see the spiritual leaders of Jamaica as a body. And believe me, within the spiritual leading of this country, we already have our problems. And I want to see the Medical Association of Jamaica involved as a body, as a group, making their contribution. Because I am sure what we are seeing happening overseas with all sorts of strange things, our medical association need, and I'm sure the Constitution, when whatever happens, is going to touch on all of these areas in some way. And so I would like to see that. I agree, you know, as yes. Ronnie Thwaite said, a few town hall meetings do not public consultation make, and I really had to laugh. And I agree with Mr. Thwaites and others that we need at least one year of public education. Every Jamaican ought to have a voice in this process. The fact that you can't read and write don't mean that you don't understand and can't make your input. Listen to the man in the street. I, um, learned, I learned about Goat Island when the interview was done with the people, the fisher folk down in um, Old Harbor Bay. That's when I really learned. And then it, that died a natural death. Uh, Mrs. Allen? Yes. You have quite a detailed I'm, I'm going to comment. I'm going to I, I can I make one recommendation, though? Yes. If you just encapsulate it and yes. send it in, don't mind whether it is double space, single space, okay. grammatical, or edited. All right. A lot of yes. substance in there. Okay. Let me, just con let me just finish now. Therefore, my concern is what part of the Constitution will be changed, Minister, if we could have them listed? Jamaicans could read them and then show us what will those changes be replaced with or by. Thank you, ma'am. Okay? Thank you. Mrs. Allen is my client. She has been my client for years. So she and I are the same vintage. Right, Sonia? Okay, good. So I understand her thinking. And a lot of the things that she spoke about, which the minister will answer to, are not constitutional issues. But she says, why spend the money? Well, from the time Elizabeth did, you know, a lot of the things that we have are police uniform and all sorts of other symbols have to change. Because it has E to R. Elizabeth the second, Regina. The prosecution of criminal cases and a lot of the legal documents are done Regina versus Hugh Small for whatever offense I've charged for. It now has to be Rex versus Hugh Small. So already even without any initiative such as that, which is being taken, undertaken by the government and the opposition, we have been put to expense because we are under the coattail of Kamala and her husband. But let me read to you. Yes, Peter, Kamala and her husband. <laughs> right. Let me read to you the beginning of the law 
where Jamaica Parliament changed its own constitution to bring in the Bill of Rights. I'm reading now. Whereas successive joint select committees of both houses of parliament gave further consideration to the recommendations and received and considered representatives by representatives made by members of the public, representations made by members of the public in relation thereto and made recommendations thereon. And then it has a date on which the Governor General put his signature on it. Now, therefore, be it enacted by the Queen's most excellent majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate and the House of Representatives of Jamaica, in accordance with the provisions of Section 49 of the Constitution of Jamaica, and by the authority of the same as follows. So even when we have amended our constitution, it says, by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty. There are some symbols that need to represent us. So that we feel that same sense of the importance of symbols as we feel in relation to our music, in relation to our literature and in relation to a, sim a symbolism that is Jamaican that has nothing to do with the royal family. <laughs> Dr. Henry. Yes. Um, Mr. Small has responded to the second part of your question, which has to do with cost and why. And in his own inimitable style, he has responded. I wanted to respond to the first part of what you said. Why the rush? It resonates with me. This is a process that needs to take reasonable time. And we have shared this very frankly at the committee level. We feel that this is a process that requires public education as a very, very important part of the process. It will involve as well public engagement as we are doing today and public consultation and those consultations must involve and you have mentioned a number of groups, Bar Association, PSOJ, etc., etc. And we do intend to do so. We have actually started that process of inviting groups to come to us. If there are any other groups that wish to come, we are saying yes, we want um, you to come and speak to us. Speaking from the minister has indicated a government timeline, which he has said they will be backing away from. And it is my desire, speaking very frankly and bluntly, that it is a reasonable time, timeline that pr facilitates the kind of public education and, and consultation that is needed. But that we need to deal with it step by step and in a timely way, so that we don't just put it on the back burner, but we, we deal with it for the reasons that Mr. Small has indicated. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Can I, can I just add, Minister? Dr. Sorry. Spence. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Because you mentioned some of the specific groups. I am Chair of the Public Engagement and Communication Committee, and I've already been in contact with all the groups that you mentioned. I'm waiting on the Junior Doctors, the Jamaica Medical Doctors Association. I've spoken to the President of the JTA, the President of the, the Chairman of the Police Federation, all the unions. And we will also be having a consultation with the Confederation of Trade Unions next week, Thursday. And I'm waiting on the professional organizations to respond to us and to give us a date. And they've indicated that they will revert soon with those dates. So we have been reaching out to all the professional groups, all other civic organizations that are interested, asking them, are you interested in having this conversation with us? We would like to have the conversation with you. So I don't think you have to um, have any fear around who will be consulted as long as we can find a group of Jamaicans, even if you can put a group together that is willing to engage us and have a conversation with us on how you see this process and what you want to be involved in it. You can reach out to us. I've already said to 
MPs, you know, we want you to start putting the groups in your constituency together, even if it means that we have meetings by Zoom, we will do that. If you need us to come face to face, we will do that. So I think that there's a commitment to public engagement, and as long as there's a group of Jamaicans who want to engage us, or want to use us to, to clarify any questions they might have, they can reach out to us and we will make ourselves available. Thank you. Senator? Thank you, Mrs. Allen, for making those remarks. I understand completely how you feel. We have many, many problems that need our urgent attention here in Jamaica. But part of the way in which we can actually transform a country is when we as a people have some pride about who we are. And that's not empty, an empty symbolism. It's, an, it's, it's filled with possibility. Jamaica, when we see our athletes performing on the world stage, that sense of belonging, that sense of patriotism, that sense of identity is overwhelming. And that is what we want to see when we say that we are Republic of Jamaica. I can tell you that it disturbed me when I realized that King Charles, our king, wanted each one of us here to pledge loyalty to him. We are his subjects. And on top of that, we cannot go to visit our head of state unless we pay a lot of money to get a visa. We cannot access our final court of appeal unless we pay money to get a visa. These are important things. These are important things for this generation and the generation to come. Listen, this is a momentous act. It is probably the first and only time that you will see the government and the opposition on the same stage <laughs> saying the same thing. Because if we don't do that, if we don't do this process as united people, we will not succeed. And here is a remarkable thing about it for me. This is a time when the people's voice has to be heard. This is a time when the people will understand what a real democracy is because parliament can't do this for you. You have to do it for yourself. Never before, never before has independent Jamaica embarked on this journey. And it is a very, very important and significant journey. And I want you just to reflect on it, to reflect on the possibility of a rebirthing of Jamaica, a constitution that impacts the people, a constitution which the people will feel a part of because they had a say, a transformational act when we can ask that our leaders be held accountable, when we can, as somebody says, look at fixed terms, when we can define exactly who we are as a people in a preamble. That is important. And that is why I am appealing to you all to go out there and advocate for us to decolonize. Go out there and advocate for everyone who can vote to register to vote in this referendum. That will return our constitution to the people, and that will define who we are. Thank you, Senator. Before, before Councillor Jones Oliphant speaks, just one small matter on the question of the cost to change to new forms. Perhaps this process will push the government's um, thrust towards a paperless ministries and paperless agencies. So it's actually going to accelerate the digital transformation. But over to you, Councillor.
It's working, I think. Try again. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome committee members to Manchester and Mandeville in particular. My question is, all of us in this room are privileged sons and daughters of Jamaica. How are you going to reach the small man in rural Jamaica that he feels a part of this constitution reform? What means are you going to use to reach them outside of us? Thank you. Okay, so I thought, if I, I might, you came with some suggestion. Yeah, if I might answer of as the publication, as the publication, as the chair of the public engagement committee, one of the things we I know is absolutely necessary, councillor, is for people like you to be involved, because there is no and I, my friend is standing in the white shirt there and the Bethlehem teachers teach together, and I was saying, and I know he's a a, a councillor. To be <laughs> councillor candidates, and I said to him, you know, Carl, people like you as councillor candidates who have people on the ground, and I said it to MP Crawford, that and, and MP Mikel a while ago, start putting your groups together. You need to start having those conversations with people. It's the only institution in this country that is empowered to really politically educate Jamaicans is who. The political parties. It's the responsibility. It would have been good if in our schools we were teaching civics so that we could have been a further along in the conversation. But for now, that is not happening. And so the institution that is responsible for getting people up to date with this conversation is, happens to be the political parties. The political parties have a huge responsibility to ensure that across the length and breadth of Jamaica, in every constituency, in every division, these conversations are being had. But we also have other institutions that we are relying on. So when we come to a place like this, we know we can't reach everyone, but we have the church represented here, and church is held every Saturday and Sunday and on Wednesdays and Mondays in Jamaica. Those conversations must be had in the church. They're justices of the peace who are leaders in their own right, their service organizations, the Rotary Club, the Lions Club, all of the service organizations where people meet to discuss matters related to their well-being and to all our collective, our collective well-being as Jamaicans. These conversations must be had there. And I know that we have the capacity in our local leaders to do, to do that. So even if we are not at the table as a constitutional reform committee, there are leaders in Jamaica who can begin the conversations, but if we are needed, then they can also reach out to us to help to facilitate the discussions. So while the committee has a remit, and the subcommittee that I chair has a remit to make sure that Jamaicans are engaged, we can only rely on those organizations that are at the heart of the local organizing of people to ensure that the message gets out there. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Spence. Good night, everyone. So, my name is Serena it. Barnes, and I, I think I can't, it's safe to say that I'm the youngest person here, and that should say <laughs> a lot. Um, and I don't think it's a joking matter, really, because I don't think persons of my age are actually interested in this, and they should be a part of the discussion. It was interesting that you mentioned a long list of persons that you would call to, but I never heard anything about high school students. So um, my first question, I had a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, I, I plan to represent all the young people who should have been here, but nevertheless, my first question is, how does the youth voice add to this reform? So I want to know, will we be able to frame the constitution that we want to see? And will we be able to also frame the republic that we want to see? Um, I also have, yes, yeah, so that's one of the questions. I'm going to invite Sujay Boswell, who is a youth representative on the committee, to respond to that. Good evening, everyone. So let me just say thank you, Sabrina, for joining us this evening. I think it's really good that you, you've turned up and are part, and participating in this way. 
So in terms of youth participation, it is something that we have to be very deliberate about. As you see, you've taken the initiative to be here, and there are a lot of young people who are apathetic about the process for many different reasons. And it's something that we have to acknowledge and appreciate for what it is. So in terms of strategizing and reaching youth, we actually have to go into the spaces where young people are because that is the reality of what we face. So as it pertains to students at the high school level, we have been engaged in the National Secondary Students Council, which is made up of the different student council leadership across the, the island. Additionally, what we'll be doing is to engage as well the Jamaica Prefects Association because they're in the schools and they are leaders who are seen to be reputable in the schools and they can be advocates and ambassadors for what we're doing, both from a feeding up perspective where they're sharing their perspectives on the issue, engaging the students in the schools, as well as taking the information from the CRC back to the institutions. We'll also be engaging through the National Youth Council. We've had some engagements with them already. And so from a community perspective, the National Youth Council as well as the National Police Youth Clubs they are within community spaces. So it is a multi-pronged approach to engaging youth across the country. One of the things that we have to do is to engage in a youth-friendly way. So the constitution as it is, is filled with legal jargon. It's technical, it's technical language. And so in our work as a CRC, we have to ensure that the information is packaged from a youth-friendly perspective. And so what we're doing is that we're engaging with different partners to break down the language. We'll also be rolling out a poll very shortly and we'll be focused on young people in high schools as well. So there are different strategies that will be deployed to ensure that the youth perspective is incorporated and integrated in the processes of the Constitutional Reform Committee. I should like to add that uh Youth Engagement Subcommittee has in fact been formalized and the terms of reference are being finalized. And that will be chaired by Sujay Boswell and we will reach out for members from the youth group. And we've also been engaging with the university and colleges. We actually had a great constitution debate on Monday at the University of the West Indies where the moot was the president in the republic, UTEC, debating UWI. Fascinating discussion took place. Okay, thank you. The next question is for you, Minister. Will this reform reignite the discussions of repatriations and reparations? Because we're talking about, you know, Jamaica being for Jamaicans officially. Um, so will we start to get back what is ours? <laughs> I'm going to invite Mrs. Lalita Davis Mattis, who is the chairman of the National Council on Reparation. And her presence on the committee should tell you something. But it is my hope that yes, yes, we will get back a lot, beginning with belief in self, that we are good enough, regardless of the color of our skin, that we are good enough. Belief in each other, that we can take decisions in our best interest. Belief in our integrity, belief in our humanity, that we can treat each other better. Because you see, once we start believing in ourselves and our own self-determination, then we can get back some of the more tangible things that I think have been stolen from us. This is a process and we will have to determine collectively what it will mean to be Jamaican going forward, what we will stand for, what will be our values, what will define our Jamaicanness. Lalita? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for very important question, and just to note that um, within the first couple of meetings of the committee that we already have put that on the agenda because there is a process towards reparatory justice 
that we're pursuing as we speak. So there's a national council, and the response by Minister Olivia Grange announced about two years ago a policy that we're pursuing at this point. There are different machinations in that entire process, but it is also very much closely aligned to what we are doing now. Um, that process started before, but it is very much an opportune time for us to engage. And I will also say that just from the, process, just from the perspective of reparatory justice, it's such an exciting time to be discussing republicanism within that context. You ask about whether or not we are going to get back what we want. No, the policy is speaking to a number of those issues. And remember, too, that that's also a CARICOM process. Um, the, the, NC, the National Council of Reparations is also still pursuing the issue of the apology from the monarch. Right? All those issues that we had discussed, those are, those are not in abeyance at all. Those are actually being pursued concurrently with this process. So I really want to thank you very much for raising it because it's a very important topic. Thank you. And then the last question for you again, Minister. What kind of republic do you envision for us as young people and does this include us being sovereign? Include young people being sovereign? <laughs> uh, I envision a redistribution of power in the state and in the government. I envision those who act on behalf of the government and on behalf of the state will treat each other respectfully will bring the best of their expertise and their experience in making progress on the problems that we face as a nation. I envision our mainstreaming excellence in our culture as opposed to pockets of excellence. And we have seen glimpses of those pockets of excellence as Senator Scott Motley said when our gold medal um, record-breaking athletes germinate on the international stage, national pride stir within our breast. I look forward to seeing all Jamaicans given an opportunity to realize their potential in whatever field. I look forward to the laws that are passed for our benefit and our protection being enforced. I look forward to a gentler, milder government, but a strong government, not an oppressive government. I look forward to our respecting each other more. And I look forward more than anything else that the people who are set to govern us do not appear to be replacing the colonial masters. I, I want to add to that. Out of this engagement, out of these discussions, I, want to, I look forward to a republic where people will begin to participate in governance to participate, to understand and pay attention to the laws which are being passed in the country, to understand that they have a duty to hold the members of parliament and their representatives accountable. I want to see a republic where the members of parliament will go back to their communities and discuss what they are doing in parliament, not just go to the parliament to talk about their constituencies, but when significant pieces of legislation are to be passed, that they have public discourse about what it means and the impact. I want to see a full and total engagement where democracy can actually exist because its citizens' part participation is paramount and they will understand that. Thank One you. more thing. I also look forward to a machinery of government that serves its internal clients well. 
you only have to hear the grievance of people in the public sector about their experience within government. And if you can't serve each other well internally in government, chances are you're not going to serve those who are external to government well. And more than anything else, I look forward to the time when I shall have retired from public life and I have to call no one in any place for anything because there would be a minimum level of efficiency that we enjoy government services with, more than anything else. Member Phillips. Thank you. Just, just two things, and I, I, the first one is related to Auntie Sonia, because part of the issue of why, as a parliamentarian told that I want to see the change is that there are some of us in parliament that refuse to say the prayer. Yeah? Because there's a section of the, the prayer that speaks about the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the king, the public weal and peace. And I'm not going to pray to no king. Yeah? So, I am a Christian, so I'm not praying to no king. Yeah? But just to pick up where Senator and the Minister left off, and, and I, in 2020, when I tabled the, the private member's motion, the question that was asked of me then was what becoming a republic how will it change the lives of our people? And I think that is the greatest challenge that we have. Because when the young lady asks, what is it that you want to see? Some of those aspirations are things that we don't need to become a republic to actually see those things. And I think the greatest things for Jamaicans is really to see how government, and I'm not speaking about this government itself, but how, how government will work for the people. I think that is critical. I think that's why there's apathy amongst a generation in why it is that this really don't matter. Because how is it that their lives are going to be any different in us becoming a republic? So I think that is, we, we need to not only explain the importance of our own identity, but as a parliament, as a government, how it is that we're going to change our ways to ensuring that we serve the people for what it is that they want. That's our point. Thank you, you know, for those you points. Know, ladies and gentlemen, um, and Mikhail has reminded me of something. We must set some offices high above political partisan tinkering and I strongly believe that we have to move to depoliticize the civil service because let me tell you using extreme examples if people are placed in the civil service based on their partisanship you can have one of two things on the extreme happening when your party is not in power, you'll say, I'm not doing anything to make the party in power look good. That's one extreme. Or you may find on the other extreme, I don't have to do anything because my party is in power, nobody will fire me. <laughs> it's really in our best interest that sensitive appointments be placed in the office of president, which would sit above the political offices, and that we move to safeguard sensitive appointments because of the impact that the functions and powers to be exercised will have on the people. Thank you, Minister. My name is Jackson. 
Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, minister, members of the committee, moderator, MPs. The last referendum that we had was highly politicized. And people, a lot of people didn't even know what they were voting for. They voted based on what each political party suggested to them or preached to them to vote. What are we going to do this time to minimize that? Now, we know that we have freedom of speech, right? And the politicians, MPs, caretakers, um, councillors are very influential to people, especially those people who are minimally educated, those people who do not read much, do not listen to the news, do not, are not aware, are not, not aware of what is happening. They just follow what the MP or the political leader says or suggests. What are we going to do this time to minimize it? Are we going to gag the politicians? <laughs> I mean, everybody is due free speech, but maybe we should say you cannot express your opinion in public. Keep it to yourself. Well, right. Senator Scott Motley <laughs> and I are politicians. She's in um, the Senate. I'm in the House of Representatives. We have MP Mikhail Phillips and MP um, Rhoda Moy Crawford. And uh, among the four of us, we are on different sides of, of the aisles. We were discussing internally within the committee the dilemma that we face. And I said in an earlier meeting that when Senator Scott Motley spoke on the issue, it brought such clarity for me. We are expected to agree across the political aisles in order to have a bill put to the people for their approval. The process is a long one. And if we get too close to an election, the real question is how will we campaign since we are competing? It's a competitive political space. And it is something that we continue to ponder. It is for that reason why when we're looking on the timeline for the bill, we had counted backwards from the end of the life of the parliament, give and take, and how long it would take to pass the bill through all of its stages, including putting it to the people for their approval. And that's how we arrived at what has been viewed as a rush or an ambitious timeline. But if we don't do it in the life of this parliament, when will we do it? When we look back on how, how much talk was done and it never happened, if we didn't have a timeline to do something, chances are, important as this forum is, it wouldn't be taking place. So it's the million dollar question. It is my hope that since the committee is constituted as an advisory committee, including, among others, representatives from both sides of the parliament or agreeing to a process, that we will honor that process. And internally, within the committee where recommendations are to be made for consideration, that any view of the government or opposition, PNP, JLP, could be brought to the committee through the respective representatives so that we can have the benefit of other members of the committee thinking on it. Because if, if, we, if we agree that now is the time to make the change, even while we must educate and engage, and we don't take the step to get a bill in the parliament to make the amendments, the change will never happen. So it's going to be a test of our democracy, of our maturity, and whether we can truly rise above the natural instinct of partisan competitive politics that we have not practiced very well, but thankfully, 
in spite of the practice, we have not had instability around transitioning from one administration to the next. But, but it is something that um, I think all of Jamaica will be looking to see. I certainly know that um, I am proceeding in faith because if you don't believe something can happen, it will not happen. And um, I'm, I'm grateful for the very constructive manner in which the opposition members of the committee have engaged the process. But I also recognize that um, all of us have constituents that are bigger than the space of the committee. And sometimes things happen that we have no control over. But it is my hope that not just good sense, but better sense will prevail. Because we have too many examples of how not to do it. And very little example of how to do it. But I do believe that we are capable. Senator? The, the other, oh, the other um, comment is that if the referendum, the result of the referendum is that we form a republic, that I would like to suggest that as we, as the form of the republic um, is, is decided upon, that one of the pieces of education papers that you put out to the public is a comparison between what our format is and what the format of the United States of America is because a lot of us have either lived in the United States of America or we watch a lot of TV programs, CNN and so forth and we are somewhat familiar with that system so if we make a comparison with that system, I think it will be a lot easier for a lot of people to grasp what it is that our system is to look like. Thank you so much for that suggestion. We're fortunate to have an international constitutional law expert. I hope he is tuned in, and I'm going to task him um, with providing us with that comparative frame between the U.S. and what it is that we will ultimately propose. But thank you so much. Our, our colors, our national colors, are black, green, and gold. Hopefully we'll keep those colors in the new republic. I can't see how Jamaicans would agree to change that when we have been dominating and jaminating and the flag is so identified with us as a people. Okay. That's not one that's up for change, at least Good. not that I'm aware of. What, what I would like to see, and a lot of us would like to see, is that the color between the green and the black, which looks to most of us like yellow, should look more like gold. It is supposed to be gold. So you're like my husband who complains when he sees it looking more gold, yellow than gold. Yes. He says, that's not yes, the right that's, color. That's not the right color. We need to change to the real color, gold, not yellow. Duly noted, sir. Actually, one of the proposals is to have our national symbols in the Constitution, including our flag and so on, or national anthem, or pledge, etc. Yes. The different of the shade of gold and the shade of green in the, the Constitution. I shall take that on for further recommendation. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, evening, everyone. My name is Marco Duhaney. My question leans more towards the structure of our government. With no king, there's no governor general. Where does that leave the justice of the peace system? <laughs> you have framed it so well and so simply and so clearly. Thank you. Costas came into the question, the custodies. <laughs> Justices of the peace are created by our own legislation, by our own laws, and they will continue. The important thing is to make sure that in the same way we're talking about depoliticizing a number of other institutions within our country, that we make sure 
that we elevate the status, the office, the role of the Costas as the Chief Justice of the Peace within the parish, and that her or his influence is able to spread through the Justice of Peace who exercise important functions within our country. But, yeah, you want to say something? Else? Yeah, one last question. Will they answer to the president or will they be their own autonomous body? Well, you know, one of the things we need to do is to make sure that they, that we really establish a job, the office of president in a way that it commands universal respect and that since the Costas will in all probability be the representative of the president in each parish that that same influence flows through the Governor General to the Costas and into the JPs. But it is something about which we need to have more discussion and I welcome your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good night, everyone. My first question is, what is the proposed timeline? Sorry, you didn't give us a name, you know. Sorry. My name is Carl Smith, councillor candidate. What is the proposed timeline for getting all of this done? Just let me read through the questions and then we can answer. What are the anticipated roadblocks in getting this done? If we are planning to be away with the king, that simply means we are going to leave the Privy Council. And the final question, are we in consultation with Barbados, who has just um, become a republic? When we formally began the work, We'd set out in the terms of reference, we'd agreed in the terms of reference to a timeline for tabling the bill by or on May 30, which would be another two weeks. Between the commencement of work and now, um, different groups in the society have asked for a different sequencing of the steps. So normally, the deliberations would be informed by the views as we understand them, including from direct consultation. But the major part of the education would have been focused on the bill itself that the people would have to vote to approve. Um, uh, a low group of persons have questioned whether that is a process that we should take. Where we are now, accepting that engagement with the public is important and also educating the public about what is in the Constitution, what it is that we propose to change, and also hearing from the public what their views are. We have suspended the timeline to then make an assessment of what the process of engagement will yield. We will not be able to correct the lack of education in a single year or even the timeline that is proposed. I know to Ms. Allen ask as part of what you're asking, why rush? And I thought to myself, it's interesting to hear a perspective that says, trying to implement recommendations made 30 years ago would be regarded as a rush. But I think the other part of it is really, know that you have told us what you're going to do, give us some time so we can think it through. The goal is to, is to do this work before the life of this parliament comes to an end. And if that is to be done without or getting in the crosshairs of election, then we will have to table a bill sooner than later because of the time that it will take to go through the process um, to meet the requirements of section 49 of the constitution which sets out the process for amending the constitution and also the holding of a referendum, meaning taking the vote of the people to approve the bill that would have been passed by parliament. 
Thank you. The second question was, what are the anticipated roadblocks you're seeing? I think um, people have been trying to wrap their minds around the phasing of the work. Some want everything to be done at once. And there are also a number of points of grievance in the society that people want to be heard on. And when we hear, we realize that there are real issues to be addressed, but they are not real issues for this particular process of amending the Constitution, ultimately with a view to putting a new Constitution together. Um, I, I think there are some... Nadine, you want to add to any of the anticipated roadblocks that you see? Yeah, I think, on I think Carl, one of the Thanks, Minister. One of the things that we have talked about is, and I, and I particularly, and I think other members of the committee have talked to the Minister, about really engaging the Ministry of Education about putting civics back into schools. And I hear that there are some schools that teach civics. Um, and, but we need civics to be um, substantially developed and, and our, our young people need to be taught how it is that we engage this process of the Jamaican democracy, you know? Um, so I think that is one of the realities that we have come to terms with. I think the other thing is um, we have to pay attention if, if it is, for me, if it is that we are, so this referendum demands, I think, that both political parties be on the same team, right? Singing from the same hymn sheet, saying the same thing. If both political parties don't, we are not going to have a successful re referendum. And a successful referendum for me is one where as a nation we agree that we want to be a republic. So to me, that, that for me is a huge, Issue. If both political parties are on the same team, then this is something that can be done easily. Easily, easily. Because as I said to you, Carl, I've lived here long enough to know that if our members of parliament want to get this knowledge into the minds of the people, this can be done just like that. But again, I think for me, that's the biggest rule. Can I say so? The lack of education around who we are as a people and our political institutions and the kind of tenuousness of our politics. And I think in regard to the tenuousness of our politics, I sincerely hope that Mark and Andrew are sitting quietly and listening and recognizing that the responsibilities of leadership that they bear are very heavy now, and that neither of them can put the question of their perceived legacy in front of the interests of the Jamaican people. So if I could just three words. Ignorance has to be addressed. It's one issue. Apathy and the need for unity. Uh, the third question, thank you. If we are planning to leave the king, are we prepared to leave the Privy Council? <laughs> it's a question that we will have to confront head on. One of the reasons why the issue of which final court is not being well, two reasons why the issue of which final court is not in this first phase of the reform is one, the process to change that does not require a referendum. And secondly, there is no consensus at this time. There are options on the table and we will have to work and hear the views. The, the opposition have made it very clear what their preference is. Um, I have indicated that I come to the table with an open mind. Jamaicans have been expressing their views and the opinions are divided on the matter. But we will have to deal with this issue head on and that is to come in the second phase of the work. No, I, I want to answer that. 
because this is probably the greatest bone of contention between the opposition and the government. The Privy Council is part of the whole process of colonization in my view. And if we are going to become a republic, we have to have a total disconnection. The Caribbean Court of Justice has been in existence for 18 years. Its judgments have been applauded by even the Privy Council itself. And Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Bruce Golding, who was once again the, Privy, the Caribbean Court of Justice, has acknowledged publicly that he has looked at the judgments and he holds them in high regard. We have contributed to this court. We paid over 27 million US to ensure that the court would have financial stability. And the only challenge which I would throw out to the minister, understanding very well that it might not be her view, is that put it on the table now, what it is that the options are so that the people can also examine them and make a decision. We need to see the options. That is the only thing that I ask at this stage. Let us have the choices. <laughs> I so, thought you were so, the final a while ago, Mr. Smith. Oh, <laughs> so, so let me I want to get say, out. Let me just say that, <laughs> that it's, was an echo. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting um, that just on the weekend, I listened in to one of the many fora convened to discuss the issue. And the overwhelming view in, in that forum was that the Privy Council should be retained. <laughs> so let's just say, let's just say that um, the form in which we use the Privy Council at this time as a judicial committee cannot be the form that we use the Privy Council going forward should we continue to use the Privy Council until such time. I can put it no higher than saying that this is a matter that we will have to discuss frontally. The other option for consideration is a final court for Jamaica. And, and we will have to ask and answer how are we going to finance it when there are issues around the current justice system, when we have already invested so much in the CCJ, but let me tell you what is clear, and I can only speak for myself at this time. I absolutely take offense that we need a visa to utilize the Privy Council. And I think the government formed in the name of His Majesty, King Charles III, King of Jamaica, should reconsider this issue until we make our determination. I really think it's objectionable. Are, are, no, no, we, no. <laughs> are we in consultation I, with Barbados? Can I say this, Carl? We're in consultation with so many countries. When I got the package for this committee, it was a huge book with whole heap of constitutional, Mauritius, Barbados, uh, um, and we have constitution. One of the things that people had taken issue with at the time when the committee was constituted was that there was somebody outside of Jamaica on it. One of the things I learned was that our constitutional expert, Ms. Dr. Lloyd Barnett, sits on so many other, con or, or participates in other constitutional reform process. So from his knowledge, and the knowledge of the other international experts at the table. We draw on the experiences of several other countries, South Africa, Mauritius, yes, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, um, all the other countries that have gone through this process and learning as well about how other systems that we are exploring are dealing with some of the hard issues that they have to deal with. So we are drawing on not just Barbados, on the lessons from Barbados, 
but all the other countries in the Commonwealth who have walked this route and other countries in the world that are engaged, have been and are engaged in the process of constitutional reform. Just to say also that I am part of a, a little group of law ministers and attorneys general, which include the law minister and attorney general of Barbados, and we have discussions behind the scene. We exchange a um, lot of information. So on another level, there is close contact. Thank you. Yes, sir. Your name and you are the last, you have the privilege of being the last person <laughs> tonight. Good evening. My name is Errol Smith. I just want to ask, um, I, it is bantered about by the, um, your team up there that um, consensus will be seat between the JLP and the PNP in choosing a president. I am suggesting that um, our arts in F civil society, our civil society group can nominate a president, um, a person for president who are not just leave it up to the JLP and the PNP because they will only choose persons that they think will feather their nest and we civil society should nominate a persons that they think would be there for them and not for the political f persons them that will be running the political, uh, their political agenda. The next thing I would say to um, the minister, I heard she was saying that the president will. So I am getting from her that the president, um, she had a fashion, she fashioned a president already because she was saying that civil servant and those boards and all of those things will be um, choose by the president. So I am saying what I'm seeing now is the president will have free hand to go out and choose the, the, the people that they, that he think is best to manage all these boards and different things that now the prime minister choose and basically choose his friends and his party affiliates to run these things. So we'll want a president that, that um, will have that authority as president to choose for the people, not for the political people, them to be nice stuff, for the people to run these boards and um, different um, organizations that now the Prime Minister choose to choose those persons. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Mr. It, Dr. It, Henry. Let me see if I understand you. So your, your, your recommendation is that the President should be nominated by the people? Yes. Okay. And not by the... the, the, the Political, the political process. Because right now there are minorities. Civil both, society. Yes, there right. are minority. Both the JLP and the PNP right now in this present country is minority. So they shouldn't have all of those power to choose somebody to rule over us so, consistently. So I just want to be clear what you're saying because... That they are minority now. No, you must I, have the people don't vote for them. Yeah, I, I just want to say what you're saying resonates with me, but we have to figure out how that could work. All right? How, the second thing is you were saying that that president should be able to make appointments in sensitive areas of governance. Because the, what the, the minister was saying that the, when she has a concern about the, the civil servants and the, the different boards, she was saying that the president will have those authorities. So therefore she already fashioned that that president will have power. And that's what we want. Let me clarify for you. Currently, the civil service is actually, a civil service is supposed to fall under the head of state in our current system, but the practices do not align with what we have. I'm pleased to say that where we were 10 years ago, even seven years ago, is not where we are today around populating public bodies, the boards of public bodies. We have actually gone through significant legal reform in that area, and we now have competency profiles, real sophisticated system to address the genuine concern about who gets to sit on the boards of public body and in turn how they are governed. The law, the law by way of regulations, they were approved in the parliament and you can access them at the Ministry of Finance website, you can access them at the parliamentary website. So contrary to what some may believe, we're already way down the road on that. 
in respect of sensitive offices, it's not just the wide civil service alone, but there are also other important offices. Just to link back, Ms. Allen, you said you wanted to hear what the Chief Justice had to say on the proposal and the group, but the judicial branch of government is actually separated from the executive and the legislative branch. And in a normal course of things, honoring the separation of power, a chief justice doesn't get involved in the lawmaking process. After the law is passed, or the, the role of the judiciary and the chief justice as head of the judiciary would be to interpret the law, and in particular, to determine whether the law is consistent with the Constitution. So that's a learning point um, that I think all, everyone needs to be aware of. The judiciary does not get involved in the lawmaking process because that, that is a, would be a clear violation of the separation of powers doctrine as we have it separating the judiciary on one hand from the legislature and the executive on the other hand. But sir, um, I hear you, I hear you about the people having a say. And I think more in than choosing anything the president, else. In choosing the president, not just the JLP and the PNP. Civil yes. society should choose or right. nominate somebody right. that they think can be their I president. I have taken note of it. While everyone is raising their questions and their suggestions, I have been noting them. And of thank course, the, the, the forum is on record. But thank you so much for sharing your views. And point, pointing, sir, to the, in, the, the contact information was on the screen where you can send your suggestions, whether by WhatsApp or, or by email. Okay. So anyone in here has a developed position that they want to write a paper to the committee for us to consider? You, the, the contact information, it's not there now, but at different points. There you go. You can send your information to the contact information on the screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Democracy ultimately rests on a higher power than parliament. It rests on an informed, cultivated, and alert public. The members of parliament are only representatives of the citizens. They cannot represent apathy or indifference. Those are the words of Eric Williams, the first prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, famously, as Mr. Small will tell you, the man who came back to the Caribbean as a world-renowned historian and held classes at the University of Woodford Square. Public education, public awareness, Public interest is at the heart of this process. Um, citizens of Manchester, you have acquitted our parish well. You have turned out, you have been engaged, and the engagement does not stop here. You now have a responsibility to go into the highways and byways and engage more citizens. Keep yourself informed. There's a website, there's social media. There are many other avenues to get information and to share information. It's important that we keep involved in the process. I want to thank the members of the Constitutional Reform Committee for being here with us tonight. It's hard work. It's a trek back to where? To Kingston. They'll be sleeping on the bus, but it's part of the work. Oh, <laughs> importantly, I'm told to remind you there are refreshments at the back of the room. <laughs> we didn't bring you here and not give you a little food and beverage. So thank you, thank you, thank you for an engaging evening, and the work does not stop here. Thank you so much. <laughs>